Now there's some other features. So if I could, I'll just kind of move you through how, what it would look like in general, the way it's drafted now. A person would make a complaint to the police that there had been a problem. And, and that's because there, there are kind of two approaches. One is the Sandpoint's approach, which is more like the EEOC approach, uh, the, where um, the government agency would investigate the claim and then make recommendations about the claim. Um, this is what I call the criminal approach. It's fairly known to people. If somebody thinks that there's been a violation of the code, then they call the police. The police respond. They investigate the complaint and put all of the materials together and send it to the prosecutor. Now, for those who don't know, there's a difference between the city prosecutor, who typically in our city, even though there are only two of us in the city attorney's office, handles prosecution services, and the city attorney has been handling non-prosecution services. Um, in order to be able to send people to mediation and to have kind of a, not a cooling off period, but an interim where maybe some discussion could take place in a forum other than uh, as a defendant of a crime, um, we've created what we call an ethical wall or a Chinese wall. Um, it, it's common uh, in the law where you have a big firm and you don't want information passing between people uh, in the law firm about something that they have in common, right? So it's an idea of kind of separate it, uh, kind of like drawing a line down the down the Rambler back seat, you know, so your brother can't go across it. Um, that's been my experience. Anyway, um, so the police then send the materials to the prosecutor, and the prosecutor would look at the materials to see whether at the bottom it says uh, whether the city has jurisdiction or um, whether there would actually be a violation for the things that had been done and reported or whether it was pretty clearly on its face just to harass somebody. If, they, if, if the prosecutor finds those to be true, then the prosecutor would not charge, um, and they would just close the, the case. Um, the prosecutor has, and the city attorney has, have broad discretion, and this does not limit their discretion. If you trust the prosecutors to um, prosecute, the, the theory is if you prosecute domestic batteries, um, urination in public, uh, people who drink underage, uh, people who drive um, uh, while they're intoxicated, the idea is that you would trust the prosecutor to make good decisions about this kind of a case also. So that's why this doesn't limit the prosecutor's discretion. All right, if the prosecutor, <coughs> excuse me, then thinks that there's something to this, then for a while that would the prosecution, the active criminal prosecution would stop and the prosecutor would send it across to the city attorney's office. That's the one that runs to the right, the first letter to the right. And the city attorney then would look at it and his or her approach would be to try to get it mediated. Find a mediator, um, have people sit down together, talk about the differences, talk about their feelings, talk about the issues, talk about potential resolutions and work something out because the idea behind um, this in particular and to me all um, criminal statutes is you want compliance. That is the goal, not punishment but compliance. So if they sit down and they work it out, they apologize, they work out a plan, somebody gets some education, uh, they exchange information and, and the, both the complainant and the um, defendant or the person complained against work it out then at, um, at there at the top it says then they co close the complaint. It's done. There's no need to move forward. If it's unsuccessful or the people refuse to mediate, then it goes to the prosecutor and the prosecutor makes a decision about what to do with the remaining problem because it hasn't been resolved and um, the, the idea is it still needs to be resolved because it, it looks to the prosecutor to be a crime, uh, to be a misdemeanor. Now, if the prosecutor gets that and learns some other things in the meantime and decides to dismiss it, it can be dismissed, as all misdemeanors can be dismissed at any time um, prior to the calling of a jury. Or they could reduce it to an infraction. So they, the, the idea would be that they would write it as an infraction or rewrite it from a misdemeanor into an infraction, and there would be a civil fine. 
Uh, the prosecutor actually has fairly broad discretion. Sometimes if people will do what they are, have been asked or agreed to do, um, the prosecutor dismisses it after they've done a certain number of things. That's fairly common with us. Um, or they could uh, go ahead and set it up for a jury trial and have a jury determine whether or not the prosecutor has shown beyond a reasonable doubt that there's been um, a misdemeanor crime of discrimination because of uh, housing practices, employment practices, or somebody um, not allowing someone the full enjoyment in a public place. So that's, that's in a nutshell, both the structure of the ordinance and how it would function. There are a couple other pieces to this, just to kind of keep in mind. Uh, one would be that I would recommend um, that if uh, once everything is determined and if the city council moves forward with a discrimination or and non-discrimination ordinance like this, that they pass a resolution that outlines this process or a process that the council's comfortable with that would be a guideline for um, both the prosecutor and the city attorney to follow um, and also for the public to know that when it goes in the hopper, there's something else that's happening that can be expected to happen. I think it gives the people who are complained against some confidence that they won't get railroaded, and it also gives the people uh, who are complaining the confidence that they won't get dis 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 dismissed or, or not paid attention to. That's not normally what I would recommend because I like to have the prosecutor have complete discretion and the city attorney have complete discretion, but it would act as a guideline, I think, to, to inform the prosecutor and the city attorney what's expected of the council, right? Now, if it's vi the reason some ordinances have that in their ordinance is because they want to make sure that it stands out in the ordinance. The reason I don't recommend that is because if somehow someone fails to meet one of the conditions of those guidelines, I think there's an argument that you, your prosecution just failed. And I don't want the, the process that's due to interfere with what's necessary for the criminal, criminal matter. Um, so that's just a kind of a stylistic thing. But I would recommend that there would be a resolution. The other thing I would recommend that if uh, the council follows this path and decides to impose some or implement some sort of a, an agreement like this, sorry, an ordinance like this, that the city personnel guidelines then be changed to um, reflect this policy. So the city itself is showing that within the city um, uh, personnel guidelines that it follows these same principles. Uh, you'll remember that a few years ago we did consider that and it was found to be uh, not necessary at the time. Uh, it seems to me that it would be consistent if the city council would make something a criminal offense to others that it should, it should also, well, it also applies to the city here too, by the way. But it'd also be nice to have that as a statement in the city policy, which is easy to do. It would just be probably the addition of the words sexual orientation and the words gender identity expression with probably a little bit of a definition for both of those so it'd be clear. Um, that's about as short as I can make it. Um, I can, Good job. I can talk longer about it. I know you can. And, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I do know that uh, one other thing, and I put it in my, uh, my materials to you. Uh, I met with the chief of police and the uh, representative of the um, Fair Housing Commission and the chair of the Human Rights Commission to talk to them about this and ask them what concerns they had. And I, I believe that it's accurate to say that they thought this was a good starting point. I think they all have comments that they would like to make and they all feel strongly that they'd like the public to be able to make their comments and make and, and give input and I agree with that. Um, but I think in general I think and, and let's see, I think we have representatives here today so that's up to you to recognize them but I'll just speak for them. I think that they're generally supportive of the idea of having an ordinance like this. So with that, um, are there any questions that you have? Well, just probably a couple questions, Randy, to start off with. Um, you know, we've all seen the sign that, that a business can, some businesses will put up and say, we reserve the right to, reserve, to refuse, we, res, we, we, res, yeah, we reserve the right to refuse service to anyone. That's correct. And it doesn't state as to they have to have any reason why. Um, 
So does that preclude a business owner simply saying, I don't want to serve you in my business. I don't have to tell you why, but I'm not going to. Now, is that a business owner's right to be able to do that? It is now, under most circumstances, there are certain things that that people couldn't refuse someone um, service for, but um, this would change that uh, for sexual orientation and for gender identity expression. Um, I know that uh, 100 years ago they had signs that said, no Irish need apply. Um, that's not the tenor of our country. Um, so uh, it does change the relationship um, between those uh, business owners or people in control of properties. Okay, in the, let, let me it does. tell you why I have that. And it comes from my own personal business experience of all those years. Okay, And I always said that you know a business relationship is like any personal relationship. The customer has to feel comfortable doing business with the business owner. At the same time, the business owner has to feel comfortable doing business with his customer. And occasionally you'll get a customer that, you get the feeling they're just going to, all they want to do is, is take advantage of you, and at that time you end that particular business relationship. You don't necessarily express that to them, but you have that option as a business owner saying, you know what, Mr. Fife, I'm sorry, but I'm going to ask you to take your business someplace else, and I don't have to tell you why. So would this ordinance preclude a business owner from still being able to do that? Uh, because he's not saying why, and I don't. And so, would he have to? Well, that my understanding would be, and my feeling would be that the business owner could say that. But if I felt that the reason why wasn't because you didn't like me or didn't want my money, it was because I had a characteristic that um, was either gender identity um, or expression or sexual orientation. I could go to the police department and say, you know, I tried to buy some tires, and this guy said he didn't want my business, and I think that that was because I'm gay. And then I could make that complaint. The police would go through this process, and the process itself should be able to sort out whether I'm just mad because, um, you know, and I made this up or because I had a legitimate reason to go in and do business with you and you discriminated against me because of that characteristic or your perception that I had the characteristics that are protected. So, okay. and that might that include mediation. Uh, there are a couple gates here. One is the filing of the complaint. If it just makes me mad and I don't file a complaint, I don't know. And I go through and the police listen to me and collect their things, they'll be making judgments. Then the prosecutor makes a judgment, the city attorney makes a judgment, the mediation makes a judgment, and the prosecutor again makes a judgment, and perhaps the jury makes a judgment. So it's, it's hopefully set up so that it doesn't railroad anybody or uh, dismiss anybody. But, for example, a number of years ago, there was a federal institution here in town, and they called me and asked me if it was uh, – well, a person called me and asked me why they couldn't go th into that place because they had uh, an ADA-trained dog. So I worked with them, you know, just called them up and said, hey, look, you know, that's against the law. I, you know, they just want to go in and mail a letter. And they were asked not to, you know, uh, they were asked not to come in because they didn't want a dog in, I won't say where it is, but it's a federal <laughs> installation that's close to here. Um <laughs> So anyway. Where you can mail letters. You can mail letters. <laughs> said that. That's what I said. <laughs> and, and pick up letters. So, you know, I think part of that was just education. Okay. And, and so the, this is also a tool um, to, for the police officers to educate or to, for people to kind of understand. So, yes, they can say that, but there may be consequences. I understand that. And yeah. one more, if I may. Sure. Gary had something, though. Yeah, the only comment I would make uh, – is that you're free to do business with who you like as long as you don't violate the law. Whether you violate the ADA, you violate this ordinance, you violate federal anti-discrimination laws. Um, you can do business any way you like, just make sure you don't violate the law. Right.